to welcome all of you. Thank you for, for joining the panel today. And um, Paul Brown, the, the, the leader of the Sentinel project. Um, perhaps, Paul, we could just quickly introduce colleagues uh, around the table. And then after that, if I may, just call on you to give a short overview of the project to, to set the scene before we start our discussions. So, Paul. No problem. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I'm Paul Brown from Ferra Science Limited, uh, leading on the Sentinel Treescapes project. Um, I'm a remote sensing scientist, uh, geomatic surveyor, um, personally concerned with uh, monitoring the treescape using remote sensing technology to monitor the treescape, to look at the management of our current treescape, but also to monitor the new treescape as we have policy objectives to plant trees, but how are we monitoring uh, those objectives? That's a very brief introduction of me. I'll pass over to Rachel Galton from Newcastle. Hi, thanks, Paul. I'm Rachel Galton. I'm a senior lecturer in remote sensing at Newcastle University, and my research areas in remote sensing predominantly and other ground-based sensing approaches for monitoring vegetation health and dynamics broadly. And we'll go to Barbara, my colleague at Farah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, Barbara Axner. I'm a social scientist at FERA, working in the land use team together with Paul. Um, and I've been working on work package four, the exact uh, name of which I forgot, but essentially it's all about citizen science aspect and working with tree wardens to make sure that we document their experience. And I'm John. I'm director of tree science and research at the Tree Council. Tree Council is the umbrella organisation for tree groups across the UK, dealing particularly with the non-woodland trees outside woods in all sorts of habitats. Um, and we brought the citizen science to the mix to to assist the to assist Paul and the team to um, to collect some data into the ground truth that was real people. Fantastic. Very good. Well, th thank you for your introductions. Um, Paul, perhaps you could sort of set the scene for us and tell us a bit about the the project and, and what you've achieved. No problem. I'll just share my screen. I've got some slides. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to introduce the Central Treescapes for Plant Biosecurity and Risk Management Multiple Threats to give it its full title uh, project. I'm going to give a very brief overview. Um, firstly, capturing the multidisciplinary team. We mentioned it before. Um, we're lucky to have scientists and uh, collaborators from Ferrer, Newcastle University, University of Strathclyde, UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. The Tree Council, along with the Tree Council Broadland uh, Tree Warden Network, and then Norfolk County Council. So, why monitor tree health? Uh, trees are under increasing stress from pest diseases, uh, climate change, uh, there's implications for conservation, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and uh, also public safety. A little timeline, just looking at some threats and incursions over the past few years. Just want to highlight, obviously, the, the major one we've we've all heard of in 2012 of uh, ash dieback uh, decimating the ash species in the UK. So, what the project aims? Uh, first aim was to develop and demonstrate a monitoring system to detect stress from multiple causes, which is able to be deployed at a landscape regional scales. We're not looking at any specific cause of stress, we're just looking at general condition of the treescape and looking at deviations from the baseline. We're combining citizen scientists uh, with technology and modeling methods, to hopefully provide a blueprint for future deployment throughout the UK. This little diagram constructed by my colleague Rachel Galton uh, just gives a really nice overview of the project. I'm not going to go through it here, but it's a nice pausing point in the video if you ever want to look at it um, in the future. So the IoT network, the Internet of Things network we've deployed, um, we deployed week commencing the 10th of May 2021. Um, this is one of the hubs, the main hubs that all the sensors transmit their data to, which further transmits um, back to the database at Ferra. Uh, so we have the tree talkers directly uh, mounted on the trees. We have 60 of those deployed across three sites. We have 12 soil sensors in groups of two at different depths. Uh, deployed across the sites and then we also have two um, open sky spectrometers allowing us to uh, um, correct for transmittance for the canopy. We have three sites, a uh, long plantation which is a, a long thin plantation next to a road, we have a woodland site, a belt plantation and we also have an agricultural site at Lingwood uh, with trees along the railway line. So just look at those sites in a bit more detail, the main points here are the red and the green uh, spots. 
Uh, the red show the locations of the tree talkers where we have those sensors mounted on trees and the green show further observation sample trees. So the citizen scientists will be uh, monitoring their observations on both the tree talker trees and the further 30 trees per site of the sample trees. So looking at uh, tree warden engagement, has been a massive part of the project, the citizen science aspects of the project. Um, initial training was conducted on the 12th of June in 2021, a month after deployment of the sensors. And there's been continued engagement activities uh, with thanks to the Tree Council. Um, looking at seasons in the woods, so we've done workshops of spring in the woods, summer in the woods, autumn in the woods, winter in the woods. Uh, where we go around with the, the volunteers, the wardens, um, and we have IoT technology discussions, we have observation discussions, but we also have tree walks looking at species identifications and fungal identification, just really good days in the woods that keeps that motivation going. Um, we've also uh, conducted further tree warden network workshops uh, last summer, uh, bringing in the wider East Anglia, looking at uh, the different tree warden groups in the area um, and how the motivation will be there to scale up the project beyond the Norfolk site. Uh, and throughout the project, uh, Barbara and her team have been conducting surveys of volunteer motivations of what's keeping these volunteers motivated. And one key thing that's came up when we were um, looking at um, preparing for this was the technology really driving engagement and the wish to get involved with the tech, as well as the tree health observations from the volunteers was, was really key um, coming out of this. And to that end, we created a tree talker data hub which allows the tree wardens and volunteers to, to go online and look at the condition of the batteries, the battery level for each individual sensor. And they've taken ownership of changing the batteries as and when they need changing during their observations, saving the, the core project team um, um, having to travel four hours each way to change those batteries. So that's been a huge help to the project. Uh, remote sensing data, we've captured drone imagery throughout the course of the two years. Uh, we've also acquired a satellite image from the archive in September 21, and we uh, tasked another satellite in September 22, al allowing for the remote sensing upscaling and modeling part of the project. So just going to briefly go through some uh, data streams that are coming from the sensors. So this is from one of the soils, well, this is from some of the soil sensors and lo looking at how they capture environmental events. So this is in July last year, and in Norfolk suffered quite a severe drought uh, in that period. So we can see the change in the soil temperature as it rises throughout the month, peaking around the, the 21st, 22nd of July, and then slowly falling with a, with a small secondary peak. Another <laughs> unexpected finding was trees falling. Uh, Storm Dudley and Eunice uh, passed through our sites uh, in February last year. Um, we can just highlight on this particular tree, the yellow, the red, and the, the orange areas where it's like normal movement within the tree. And then on the 17th, the, the, the green area, there's, there's a bit more movement happening. And then suddenly on the 18th, the tree falls down and we can see a huge amount of movement in that sensor until it uh, reached its final resting place. So we're really capturing these events in the data. Uh, looking at light transmission through the canopy, uh, behaving as you'd expect, uh, less transmission in the summer months, more transmission in the winter months, but very different on individual trees. So it's really important to understand what we're looking at, what the sensor is looking at. So some are looking at more than one tree and some of ivy on the tree, on the trunk. So it's uh, decreasing that transmission also in the summer months. So it's very important to understand what you're looking at before you can interpret the data. So lastly, just looking at some key findings to date. So major learning outcomes is citizen science observations can capture variability in tree health. They can be subjective. Obviously, individuals look at things differently, but we've tried to constrain that as much as possible by creating an app which gives you, <coughs> excuse me, drop down menus. Well, excuse me, it gives you drop down menus and, and list the questions as you go through them. Retention of volunteers is also a thing that it, it would potentially be difficult when scaling up the project. It hasn't really been an issue in this project. We've got a core set of volunteers which have been extremely engaged. Excuse me. Which have been extremely <laughs> engaged throughout the project. And, but then there are preferences on areas to monitor, like some woodlands are nicer than others. So it's nicer to walk in those woodlands. One key thing is uh, ownership of the project and self organization from the citizen scientists, really wanting to take the, the technology and look after their technology. And they're still wanting to do that even further by 
going further in battery changes and repairing the tech in the field. There is challenges with the technology. There has been hub failures, um, which causes the data hub, the battery level um, <clears throat> monitoring system to not be updated. So that has caused issues. And the time it takes to, to get a new hub and go down and change that hub um, is a problem with the IT network. But not one we, we've, uh, but one we have managed to overcome. The tree talks themselves are, are rich, with a high temporal resolution, <laughs> but quite a noisy data source in some senses. Um, a need for extended long-term data to establish the baselines. So the current objectives what we're working on at the moment is to integrate the data streams and observations via modeling to predict tree health status, um, analysis of wider volunteer survey and stakeholder workshop to scale up the system, compile and make data available for the NERC data centers um, after the project end, and find ways to continue to support the Broadland Tree Warden Network into continuing the project beyond the June deadline when this project comes to an end. So that's a very brief summary um, of the project from me. Thank you. Oh, Paul, thank you. That's that's great. That's fantastic. And I, I think uh, you, you raised a, a very relevant example of uh, ownership of the project in, in the people coming in changing the batteries. I, th I think there's there's nothing nothing more uh, practical about that than that. Exactly. Um, no, I, I think I think that's that's very very good overview. And you had these three sites. I'm just wondering if, if any of the you mentioned some websites and so on. Are there, are there resources that could be shared with folk today? Is it a link links so you can put? A, um, they're not public at the moment. <laughs> the websites aren't public. They're very constrained to the network at the moment, just yeah, because. Yeah. Um, yeah, we didn't want to advertise the locations because one key thing was vandalism and stuff. Are these are these internet things just going to be smashed out the the woodlands after two weeks of deployment? Um, thankfully, that never happened. Never had one issue with that at all. So that was a really good learning outcome. Um, but yeah, we've tried to keep it private at the at the moment, but we will make it. Uh, yeah, very public good. And uh, open it's it's always a challenge when you put sensors out yeah, there. Yeah. What, what's going to happen to those? But I, I mean, John, if I could, if I could just turn to you, I, I'm, I'm interested in the you know, the representativeness of this, and what what's the sort of size of the challenge that that you're addressing here, and the uh, you know you've you've got these 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 sites. I, I'm just wondering how the issues that you're um, addressing really affect society and and uh, and, and wider wider implications. No need so to... obviously, from the perspective of um of the environment trees are a keystone species in that mix and obviously there's been a lot of focus over the last over the last um, particularly the last five years about the role they play in carbon and carbon sequestration and the greatest threat that we face to our treescape is that is that um arising of, of new pests and diseases that might that might alter the balance of species particularly in the case of the work that we've been doing ash dieback which you know, there's there's the potential. There's about four billion ash trees in the UK of all sizes, from little seedlings up to big mature trees. And uh, if we lose all of those, then then having an understanding of the changes that will make to the landscape. So understanding what's going on in the tree and helping to understand and model that and be able to understand that is a really vital part of going forward. Um, and even even that element of just being able to spot a new pest or disease arising, be, to be on that cusp of of being aware that there's a problem before it may show in the in the data, because obviously once it's once it's got hold, it might be too late. So so for us, this project was a really exciting way of bringing real people in to study something that was local to them, but which had which had new technology and new devices involved in it that meant that they could see that they were part of something wider, something that was addressing national problems. And if we get it right, that we something that rolls out, out elsewhere. And one of the biggest issues we faced was that of risk management on the roads. You know, if we, if we have lots of dying ash trees by the roads, uh, can we predict, is there ways to be able to, to suggest that we know that this is coming? Um, so although Paul said it was a surprise that, that we had trees falling over in the data, we did aspire to having trees falling over when we when we set up the, the the grid and the fact that it happened and that we were able to identify that and start to be able to predict before and after what the conditions were in the tree, I think was truly, truly remarkable. 
I mean, any, anyone who remembers the huge consequences that Dutch elm disease had on the landscape um, will will quickly realise that uh, ash dieback is a, is a major major threat. I guess I guess now as well. I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing about the technology, particularly about the the tree talkers. I'm very intrigued by that. Um, but maybe just before we come to the the sort of tech that you've been using. Paul, I've heard, uh, one thing we've uh, we've been asking all of the, the all of the demonstrator teams, the constructing a digital environment program is all about the digital representation of the world around us, and there've been all the different themes that the projects have been working with, and you're you're working with treescapes. I'm just just interesting what your what your you and your your colleagues' perspective of is of digital environment, uh, and you know how how have you how have you used digital in in your work to um, you know to, to 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 conduct the science that you're 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 developing what is it about digital that's lent itself very well to your your project um i think the digital i mean it allows for uh remote monitoring um there's a potential for full coverage across the landscape um combining the uh the iot tech uh to train train machine learning algorithms for for extrapolation across that landscape um, so it allows for a potential targeting of, of ground survey. You're never going to uh, replace ground survey and that expertise, but it, it, it provides a, a, a targeting of that as opposed to just sample survey. So it will take, take um, time saving and uh, being in the right place at the right time, essentially. Um, and I think particularly now we're in an era where you know, technologies are maturing um, at the same time. So we've got uh, data tech, we've got the technology, we've got these sensors you can put on trees that measure trees. Um, but we've also got the analysis, the machine learning, the AI, and uh, the computational cloud computing, the power that's able to analyze this data. So we're in an area that is reaching a level of maturity, but then also that is a challenge because technology is changing all the time. You, know, you buy one sensor um, two years ago, it's then replaced by a new sensor. So how do you integrate that new technology? That's a that's a, a very common theme that a lot of the projects have been grappling with. Actually, different yeah. instrumentation. Yeah, so it's a fascinating point. I mean, I you know we you mentioned the the technology develops and and we'll 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 come to that in in a moment. But I, I'm just interested, really. How do you, do you think this what you've done here could be scaled up or or I mean, how easy would it be to reproduce uh, taking a bit of an overview of the project what you've done in in other other. Uh, environments and another wood, wood treescapes yeah i think um i think scaling up's always been in the back of our mind it's always in my mind for other projects as well is like doing these remote sensing these digital projects on a, on the pilot study sites and the small scales is always always the question is is how do we do that across the whole of the uk treescape um yeah the warden network is a, a is a geographically spread network i mean we've we've created workshops um I've conducted workshops that bring in the other networks within the wider uh, East Anglia area, the wider Norfolk area, not just the Broadland area, and look at those motivations. So you know, the technology is there, the app's there to measure the trees. It's just, um, and the motivation is there. It's just the logistics of bringing those people together. And then the, the remote sensing data is there to scale up. You know, we, we can... We can take those ground observations, look at the spectral signatures in the canopy, and see how how we, far we can extrapolate before we need another sensor tree scan, another sensor network, and then extrapolate beyond that. Um, but it's the expense of that data. You know that 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 is another challenge is the expense of that remote sensing data. So, I think the the potential is definitely there. It's just overcoming those those issues of expense and technology availability. Yeah, you obviously don't need to instrument every tree. It's a question no. of rep rep representativeness of, of the data you have. Exactly. But I mean, let, let's turn to the, the the technology now. Oh, sorry, John, please. Yes. Before you before you go there, I think I think what Paul said is the technology is now maturing to a point that you can do it. The really interesting part is for us was was the community. Would they would they engage with it? Would they take it into their heart? And I guess what we've learned from this experience is is if you give the the citizen scientists an active voice in the program it becomes less of a we're doing it at you rather than we're doing it with you if they feel that they're part of the conversation they definitely took ownership and that that simple one of replacing batteries paul saw that when we started as a 
as a problem. The community saw that as an opportunity. They were part of the conversation. So it's, it's, it's scaling it up will require, it's eminently possible, but it will require that community engagement that makes people want to be part of the journey. Um, and trees are one of those aspects that people seem to really relate to. So I think it would be utterly scalable. Well, th thanks, John. And I think in a, in a way you've you've just helped address the the first of the uh, well a question that's currently open on the the chat, which says someone's asked, what are the post project activities following on from the project, and will and indeed can it be scaled scaled up across the country? So I think I think you've both uh, given some thoughts thoughts on that. Thank you for that. Um, Rachel, I, I believe you're the you're the you're the tech <laughs> and the person here. Um, tell tell us a bit about the the sensors and the technology that you're then what is a tree talker <laughs> yeah we should cover that in a bit more detail so thanks um this project's sort of been quite well, i guess quite complex and we're actually deploying quite a lot of different technologies within the project so ranging from the sort of field app that the wardens are using to collect the data um and their accessible sort of dashboard that's helping them to monitor the network through the Internet of Things tree talkers that I'll come back to in a minute, and then the layers of drone and satellite imaging that we hope will help us scale that up. So, but the core sort of new tech in that I think that's really exciting in this project probably is the, the tree talkers. So these are a wireless um, sensor network, um, as Paul outlined, communicate through through hubs that they can then stream straight back to us at, at Ferra. Um, and the tree talkers actually measure quite a wide range of things. So these are sensors that were developed in Italy originally um, and are supplied by a company called Nature4. And they measure um, a whole range of canopy parameters, tree parameters, tree physiology, but also some basic climate parameters. So, for example, they measure air humidity and temperature as well, which lets us really try to relate some of the tree physiology to what's going on in the environment, which is quite important. So within the little box of tricks, if you like, um, they have an accelerometer, which is how we get those tree movement data that Paul showed briefly. Um, they have a um, radial growth sensor that attaches to the trunk of the tree and is meant to measure the stem growth. Um, they have sap flow probes, but they also have a capacitance sensor on those probes that measure the stem water content. Um, and perhaps most interesting for you, for me as a remote sensing scientist, is they have an upwards looking spectrometer that's measuring light transmittance through the tree canopy in sort of 12 different wavelength regions. So that's giving us a really rich data set of what's the canopy condition like, um, but also potential to unpick some of the spectral changes that might occur, for example, if leaf pigments are changing due to disease or um, phenology as well. Um, so they're making a measurement every three hours, so we get a very rich data set, they've been running for about a year and a half now, um, so it's quite an extensive data set of observations, I, I'm not going to try and remember or quote how many measurements we now have, um, but it's a lot of data um, across all of those things. And then the other aspect of the project that I guess we could count as tech is the, the machine learning aspect of trying to bring this together. So we've been developing, a, or Ferro have been developing a hidden Markov chain model, which is a type of model that can hopefully infer the current status of an object based on probabilities and also previous and current observations. And one of the challenges of our projects, how do we bring all these observations together? We've got the sort of non-tech citizen science observations, we've got the tree talker ones, we've got the drone and satellite, but they're all at different temporal frequencies. They all cover different areas. They're all scattered in different ways across our study site and so on. Um, so the idea of that machine learning model is to try to combine those different observations and start to predict the health status of trees based on those. Um, and currently that's being parameterized based as well also on the um, long term resurvey of ash trees that's been conducted by Norfolk County Council. So we're also bringing in some wider tree data sets there as well. So I think that covers the tech probably. Well, I, I mean, yeah, th th thanks. I mean, it's interesting to hear about the Italian census. I don't, I don't know if it's possible to share a link to the uh, to those for people that would be, be fascinating to follow that, follow that up. Um, I mean, I, we've we've heard about batteries running out. That's that's not really a, a unexpected. But I mean, I, I think of every time I've tried to use uh, sensors in woodland, you find that GPS signals can't be attained, and and uh, I'm just wondering about communication and getting data back out of the out of the dense um, canopy forest. 
back to base. I mean, what, what are some of the other challenges uh, that, that you've had getting these sensors in the ground? I guess, well, I mean, the main technology challenges, there have been all of those things you've described, I think we've probably encountered. Um, and I think Paul is going to touch a bit more in a minute on the, the sort of environment, the actual sensors of the tree talker network. Um, but in a broader sense, I think the biggest challenge for us technologically really has been how to interpret the data that comes from those sensors, because we're working with sensors that whilst they've been deployed in a few small sites in other countries haven't really been widely deployed in the UK, haven't been used for tree health monitoring extensively specifically. And although for some of the sensors like SAPLOW, there's sort of established, obviously we've, you know, it's been measured in trees before, there's some baseline data to go on, but other things like the upwards looking spectrometers, that really isn't there. So how do we separate out the noise? How do we establish what's down to the species or site versus what's down to the health status? So I think a lot of the challenges have actually been in what to do with the data set and then how to scale that up and how to relate it to the remote sensing, for example, that's viewing the forest from the top. So seeing understory change as well as the tree canopy and so on. Um, I'll let Paul maybe cover the sort of pitfalls of the actual sensor network. Paul, what are the pitfalls of the sensor network? Thanks, Rachel. It's been a learning, 2021 was a learning curve. Um, like you, you mentioned transmission of data, just simple things like there's the sensors that are orientated on the north side of the, the trees, and then we had a hub on the south. Uh, so that wasn't actually the data was was it was falling behind, and we were wondering why. And then I just moved it to the north, and it it, it picked straight back up. So it's just little learning things like that. Um, obviously, at the beginning of the project, we had logistical issues around uh, COVID nineteen. That was a that was a major thing for us to deploy that network. Um, Rachel has just mentioned transferring to different climates, you know, having water ingress in some of the uh, in some of the sensors. So learning that and learning, OK, a bit of a silicon sealant around the around the edge or silicon grease around the O-rings so, uh, just eliminates that completely. So just that, that sort of learning. Um, and then little, little things like that, isn't it? That are oh, so it's important. Yeah. little things. Are, yeah, like you say, are so important, so huge and and, and animals. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's chewing through wires of soil sensors you know things like that um but that's when the citizen scientists have also been involved a lot more uh is, is fixing wires like that you know they notice when their observations oh this wire's been uh, jumping to just just fix it up and, and they do so, and then it's completely working again so that's been another again going back to the ownership of the project to the citizen scientists uh, last, um, presentation we had sheep eating the sensors so <laughs> uh, yeah and, and yeah, birds yeah, you know, problems are... we've got an upward facing spectrometer and a bird lands on the sensor you know yeah do, do what they do and then uh, covers the sensor so again the citizen scientists going around checking that sensor that window's clear and giving it a good clean every time they go around just just helps but it's did just you have, did you have to have duplication in the sensors to ensure so if something goes wrong you can sort of see that it's gone wrong or how how do you deal with spotting errors like that? I guess it's just with analyzing the data. There's, to be honest, there's no real real time. There is with the, like if the sensor suddenly stops working, you'll, you'll, we'll see it because we, we monitor every morning. We have a, a script that comes through and saying, is it okay? Well, how many sensors are working? Which ones aren't? Um, but individual sensors within the unit, like the spectrometer, uh, you have to really, at the moment, analyze the data. It doesn't come through near real time. Um, at the moment that sort of thing but that's a good point we, yeah. we've had met, met stations with tipping rainfall gauges and when one yeah. one of them stops and the, the other one doesn't you realize that there's something wrong and then you go and realize that one of them's full of leaves you know yeah. uh, so uh, sometimes you have to have that duplication built yes up. yeah um, I mean, the duplication is across hmm. the treescape in that sense in yeah. that for example with the spectrometer if a window is blocked you'll see a big drop in transmission in just one sensor whereas if it's cloudy day you see a drop in transmission at all of the or lower light levels in all of them so we can we can unpick a lot of that based on where one sensor is a very clear anomaly for a short period something rather than a long-term trend um, very good are you uh, using lora one or or 5g or how are you getting the data out of the woods um, it's well, it's using it comes it's right a SIM card, so it's not even 5G thing, it's just a GSM network. It's it's yeah, yeah. yeah. I use Laura to talk to the hubs. I use Laura to talk to the hubs, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. I mean that that's the biggest issue is when a hub goes down. 
um, because you lose all 25 sensors um, transmitting uh, the data. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And then you get a gap. Uh, you can retrieve the data because each individual um, sensor has memory inside the sensor, but it means a manual download, uh, which means going out and on screen, and it's quite time consuming. So that that has been an issue with the hubs, but as soon as you replace one, it's it's uh, it, it's absolutely fine. You do the manual download. Thank you. Uh Barbara, if I, if I could uh, turn to you, I mean, we've heard uh, some very interesting uh, anecdotes about the, the relationships formed with the tree wardens and the um, Paul Shurton photos of the training sessions you've done. And we've heard about these batteries being changed. But I'm just interested, really, because the, the, the role of people in, in, the, in, in, the, in this project has been really quite key, it seems. And maybe if you could just talk us through that a little bit more and, and you know, what, what that what the interface is between people and technology in, in a project like this and what, what can we learn learn from that? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, as I say, as we heard, um, an integral part of this project is working with citizen scientists, in this case, the tree wardens. And I think it's been quite a steep learning curve for us at the beginning. So while volunteers is obviously one stakeholder group, there is naturally a lot of diversity in terms of the individual backgrounds, which meant that some were actually very comfortable with different aspects of the technology. So, for example, we heard this multiple times now, and you've just mentioned it as well. Um, initially, the team was planning to do all the battery changes themselves, but actually the volunteers were, were more than happy to help with this. So another learning is that sort of discussions like that always benefit to, from just being a discussion directly with the volunteers. Um, and uh, yeah, so at the back of this as well, then there was an update to the app, which you've seen in Paul's presentation, which made it possible for the volunteers to monitor the battery status themselves. And similarly, um, there was sort of same similar elements, which um, the tree warden started doing their own spreadsheets to record which trees that they've looked at. And again, that was something that was then integrated into the app and made it easier for them to coordinate their trips. Um, and yeah, so all the volunteers were just really interested in what the technology could do and could offer and what the outputs looked like. Um, and while initially we, or at least I, wasn't sure about exactly why the volunteers might have wanted to join this particular project and whether they might want to use the data uh, outputs for themselves, it actually became clear that in general there wasn't as much interest in the, the detail, the nitty gritty of the data, but rather that it delivered something exciting, new science that could help contribute to keeping our woodlands healthy. So um, there's definitely a lot of interest in finding out about how, how this process is going, uh, whether the data is delivering what we thought it would deliver or what we wanted it to deliver. And uh, yeah, so the technology gave the project a, a, an interesting new aspect that was worthwhile contributing to. And there was also a clear desire right from the start to find out about the legacy of the project and how the outputs would be used. And uh, I think that's also highlighted uh, by just the continued interest in just maintaining the tree talker network beyond the project and one tree warden even purchasing and deploying their own tree talkers. So it was, it was all really good stuff. Um, in terms of the general public, there was, um, wasn't as much engagement and there was never any plan to, uh, but the project team, team did put up signs along with the tree talkers, just with a little bit of background and, and an email contact email to get in touch with and uh, it has encouraged or at least contributed to probably um one dog walker actually wanting to find out more signing up as a tree warden and, and joining the project team and uh, I think as well whenever the team was doing maintenance or anything similar down there they got quite a few questions from interested passers-by as well uh, that's, that's uh, yeah so you did have some dog walkers uh, co commenting on the uh on the, on the Absolutely. Um, I, I, and I, I, as a question, I think perhaps for for you, you, you Barbara, and, and indeed Rachel, um, what one on the, the the sort of the people and one on the technology side. I'm I'm just in, intrigued by the 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 level of engagement that you had. You clearly you clearly had a lot of people, Barbara, who are very interested. These wardens who are very intrigued by what you were doing and and interested to take part. Do, do you what would you say if uh, to yourself if you were starting again? Are there, are there particular sort of learning points about how you approach these 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 colleagues and 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 how you in, um, integrated them into the project? What are there any sort? What are the learning points of of how you've dealt dealt with them? I think should, should I start, Rachel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, please, please, and then Rachel afterwards. There, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, one of it was just um, keeping them in. In, informed because it's as I said before they weren't necessarily into, too bothered about the exact details but they were really interested in finding out sort of what the project was achieving 
So it's just, I think, I think at times we probably have left it quite long just because we were setting up the project, we were trying to deal with different things, but it's just making sure that we just kept them in or keep them in the loop and that oh. they sort of, they know that things are moving, things are ongoing and that, that what they are doing is contributing to the project and to the outputs. Yeah, thank you. And, and Rachel, sort of a similar question really, just in terms of the, the placing of the technologies and the, the sensors and so on. Uh, you know, what are there any particular learning points you would you would reflect on over the over the project? I think in terms of the tree talkers, we always knew we'd have a challenge, and there's only so many tree talkers we could deploy in a demonstrator project for the first time. Um, but coverage of therefore of the different species within the woodland and the health statuses has perhaps meant there's not as much replication as we might like across all of those groups. Um, I'm not sure necessarily there's an ideal solution to that other than a, you know, a larger project with a bigger scope and a bigger, a bigger budget, but I do think there's an issue around, you know, how do we choose to deploy these, where do we put them, and part of the project was to try to come up with the answers for that, so we knew we didn't have them up front. I think the other thing perhaps is because of the interaction with the tree wardens and because we were reliant on them for batch changing and so on, that did somewhat limit where we could put the tree talkers, so we did actively avoid for obvious reasons, trees that were extremely unhealthy and were at that mm. far end of the health status scale because we couldn't have tree ones interacting with trees we actually thought were likely to be a health hazard to them. So I think that's limited the range of data to some extent. I'm not sure if it necessarily means I'd do anything differently in that respect. We obviously wouldn't pick really dangerous trees to get the tree ones to look at now either. Um, but I think maybe we think about some alternatives to try to capture some of those more extremely unhealthy um, trees within the woodland. Um, I think otherwise, and some of that relates perhaps to having a site a little closer to, to Ferro where they can go more readily to, to change batteries on a small number of trees themselves or whatever. Um, I think the other thing was probably around um, the drone acquisitions. I mean, there's sort of challenges there in terms of having to do them within a limited time limited yeah. field campaigns that means sometimes it was suboptimal sort of lighting conditions and so on but in the most part that's that sort of worked all right I think um so a bigger network more tree talkers more species captured or focusing in on a single species and just looking at ash die back for the demonstrator in the first place perhaps I mean uh, um one of the one of the aspects of these demonstrator projects John uh, um to come to you is the sort of translational aspect of the of the work and and um I'm, I'm actually looking at thank you laura kelly for posting the the question um about you, you mentioned data from the survey of ash dieback disease to parameterize models and to what extent do you think signs of poor health from a specific threat such as ash dieback disease would be predicted predictive of general good or poor health in trees or might trees display their unhealthiness in different ways and I, I think maybe I could ask, just ask ask you that. And in answering, uh, of course, the DEFRA and, and 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 other you know key policymakers in 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 the country who are trying to address some of these challenges. How how can the work that you've done inform inform that that sort of translational piece as well? If if I could just before I answer that one, Stephen, and I will. If I could just. One of the key factors in relation to the previous question, one of the, you asked about learnings, one of the key learnings for me of the whole project was the ability of the project team. To, um, and and there's, a, there's this really interesting thing of when hard science hits the real world. If you had, if we'd gone with the original plan, it probably wouldn't have developed the, the amount of data and the resources that it did. And it was because the project team adapted and flexed and did things that, that weren't pure science, but the, as Paul said in his introduction, we had a walk in the woods in September just to get to keep the community engaged. That ability to flex and adapt was for me the main learning that came out of it, because without that we wouldn't have got half the engagement, half the data, half the results that happened. So I think mm. that's something that we should all bear in mind when we're doing these things. The technology is brilliant, but yeah. it only works if you get the people to to engage with it and then point. and then flipping the flipping that round into then how do we use the data that we've gathered to influence policy well obviously ash dieback is one of one of defra's main um concerns at the moment we tree council are heavily involved in those conversations at policy level 
uh, and, and helped guide uh, local authorities to developing their management plans, which is why the team wanted us to be part of the conversation. Um, so we've all the way through this project, we've been connecting the policy, well, the, sorry, the science to the policy makers um, and using the information to have the conversations to keep the to keep the conversations going. And and that is critical if you're there is that element of real science is fantastic for and of itself. But if it's to have a policy impact, you've got to be able to build the interface to build the so the project teams need to have that capacity to interact with the policymakers so that so that the output of the work actually reaches people. Um, and I'm afraid it's it's one of the academic world's biggest problems is that we do all this work, then we produce some very nice dusty paper in some very nice dusty journal and nobody ever sees it. So so one of the things that we need to do is, is to ensure that we translate all of the good science for the policymakers so that they get what they need to be able to use it in a way that, that actually means it has impact. And I... We haven't got to the point in this project where we've got the real data yet is coming because that's part of the next part of the, but the analysis of the data will be fed into all the policy conversations because that, that was always the point. But you have to have the channels and you have to have the opportunities and every project that you've got in, in the bundle of, of, of projects that you've done just needs to find those, those ways to get their information to the policy makers, but it won't be through always through academic publication. It needs to have webinars like this. It needs to have sessions. And Barbara's got Barbara's got um, policy workshops planned when we get to the, to, you know, to the to the data. So all of that will help to use this in a very positive way. Yes. Yes. Um, sorry, sorry Bar Barbara. I mean, I, I'm just interested in how you've gone about engaging with all the different stakeholders that you've that that, that are relevant for for this area. What, how how are you going about that? Uh, yes, so sorry, I was, I was still with the John's policy question because, um, as, as John said, we've got a, um, a workshop planned sort of at the end of the project. We were hoping to do that a bit sooner, but again, John's already mentioned that, um, sort of there's obviously while policy teams have shown a lot of interest already, they've started asking questions and understandably so quite targeted questions. So, um, yeah, because this project is very much a scoping project, it made more sense to have these discussions once we've got a firm idea about the shape and the implications of the data. And just uh, to add as well that for that policy workshop, we're also hoping to invite other stakeholder groups like National Rail, so big stakeholder groups with an interest in, in tree health as well. So yeah, watch this space. Um, in terms of the other activities, again, um, these things have already been uh, mentioned. So in addition to the ongoing project work with, with our tree warden group, uh, that's the ongoing uh, tree health assessments, the technology maintenance, sharing their experiences. We also had a, a local workshop in Norfolk, which was split into two parts. So um, one was for the wider tree warden groups um, on networks to share how the project's going and also to explore what the level of interest might be from these other groups. And there was actually lots of positive engagement and people actively thinking about what this could offer to their individual communities um, and what barriers that might we might need to overcome. And uh, yeah, so that was later followed up then as well by a wide, even wider survey on the motivations for citizen science. And the second part of this particular workshop was a, a, a walk through the woods and uh, on-site showcasing of the technology. And um, again, this was very well received, especially by the county council, other representatives working with parks, highways, education. Um, so yeah, again, great in engagement there. Um, something else that came through the county council was a request from the museum service, I think, which led to the tree talk or a tree talker being displayed in there from Axis, Axis, I can't pronounce this, to Acorns exhibition. And uh, yeah. it's also being used as an example on Christian Thorne's BBC Radio Norfolk show tomorrow. So just a little bit of advertising there for that as well. Oh. And that element of of this project oh. again reached out, got got publicity, got people interested, got people talking, and it's because it was vested in the community. The community, so Norfolk Radio probably doesn't care about the Internet of Things, but it does care about the fact that the community have helped with the Internet of Things. You know, it, it's it's that element of community buying, and I don't know, Paul. I know we've. We've got a little bit of video. I don't know if this is the point where we could just show how the community truly engaged with this, because I think hearing it, we've talked about citizen scientists, but to hear it from their from their own words. 
Hello, my name is Anna Rodriguez. I've been a tree warden for just over a year now. I have no background or previous experience dealing with trees. Um, soon after I started as a tree warden, the Sentinel project came up and it's been a really good way of meeting a lot of the other tree wardens in my network. I've learned so much on the Sentinel project from experienced tree wardens, especially about how to assess the health of trees, but also basics like tree and plant identification and overall woodland health. It's been very exciting to be involved with this Sentinel project. It's a really big project, uh, gathering lots of data. And we're now seeing how that data is actually being used to obtain new information on how to assess tree health. It's also been really great uh, spending time in the woods and deliberately looking at the trees and spending time with other like-minded people. Has, has it been easy to, have you found that the, 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 the interface, John, between the sort of science and policy E easy to to find or is it, is it always a, an ongoing challenge there is there is a huge amount of interest in defra in in basing policy on sound science they want they they want science they want policy to be science led mm. so any information that's available to them that is packaged and presented in a way that is useful and helpful and gives them what they need is 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 to be desired um and there are many sister projects that that the that are paralleling this work that is joining you know, is joining up the capacities for from this project to share its resources so there is plenty of opportunities um to make the links and as and as barbara said and um, the fact that people want to come to workshops to hear what's been done and want to hear about how we're going to engage it um there won't be a, there won't be problems in getting the information into the into the policy makers so for I know DEFRA are very keen on evidence-based policy making. So here, here is one excellent source of evidence that, that could be fed into that into that process. Exactly. Very good. Uh, so you know, just just looking back over the over the project, Paul, um constructing a digital environment. Have you know, have you constructed a digital environment? What are what are the what strides have you made in in that area? And you know, what, what are the challenges, I suppose, that, that remain in, in doing this, conducting this sort of research? Yeah, I think we've been successful in um, demonstrating a digital environment using environmental sen sensors um, wirelessly, and then also integrating that with citizen sciences observation. I think it's been very successful from that point of view. Um, there are challenges uh, remaining. There's network connectivity challenges. Um, you know, the, the noise in the data is a bit of a challenge, um, how we overcome that. Um, there, are, there has been new hubs released by Nature for new sensors, so that might um, help with that a little bit, going back to that technology changing and, and mm. developing all the time. Um, another challenge is, I mentioned it before, is the expense of data, expense of remote sensing data. So extrapolating these sensor networks, these observations to um, satellite observations and then using these central treescapes as almost like weather stations you have one extrapolate between with remote sensing have another one um but it's the expense of that data and the availability of that data um another thing is the, the huge amount of data that that you record you know these sensors are recording they've started on an hourly basis you know, multiple multiple data streams an hour for 18 months and um, we've knocked that down to, to three hourly just because of the battery life and, but it's still it's a huge amount of data um and how do we bring those data streams together to create a robust baseline and remove that uh, that, that short-term noise um and so are we measuring the things we can measure digitally is it correct are we measuring the right things? we have sensors given to us saying they, they measure this this and this but is it the right tech are the things that we're missing uh and bringing in the multidisciplinary uh aspects of project teams is key to is key to that uh, to get it right and you know that's is a challenge of this project we may be missing an area in the plant physiology the uh the actual tree physiology we, we, we've got a little bit of knowledge missing in that multidisciplinary aspect that going back to lessons learned we would have incorporated that at the beginning yeah i was gonna i was gonna come back to the 
you know, we've talked about the the technology, the policy links, the stakeholders, the the tree warden and so on. But I hope you, know, you guys, as a as a team, the the addressing these things, as you say, is a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, challenge. And and how 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 have you all worked as as a team? How did you set out to address this complex? I mean, you've mentioned that maybe there's some skills that could have been added to the mix. Um, how, how's it how's it worked out? Well, it's been great. <laughs> I mean, we're not new to working uh, with each other. Uh, the main core team you see on the, on the call here, uh, we have links uh, with the Tree Council from DEFRA funded projects. Myself and Rachel have worked together for a number of years on, on different projects in the in the treescape. Um, we have brought in uh, new collaborators. Uh, uh, Michael from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, uh, bringing in that ec uh, ecological um, knowledge and loaning that to citizen science and. You know, he's he's been in one of these webinars before and you can see his knowledge in citizen science. So that has been extremely beneficial. Yeah, there's been some really great, great discussions on that. I mean, I, I think there's time for one one last uh, question, which is something that's intriguing me. And maybe, Rachel, this is one, one for you. And, and there's been a lot of discussion in the demonstrator projects and in the wider CD program about digital twins and, and what, you know, what the role of a digital twin is in trying to help uh, manage and understand, look at different scenarios for the future. Do you do you think your you know this this project is moving towards a digital twin? Are, are there are there things that should be done to? I mean, what, what's your take on on digital twins? Having having done what you've done, I guess the way digital twin is going beyond measurements and into the ability to model and simulate and test out what future scenarios would look like based on that digital data. So I think within the project, we have some rich data sources that could feed into digital twins. We're starting to look at how we could integrate those to predict tree health. But I think in terms of a true forest condition sort of digital twin, one that can let you experiment with changes in um, future climate and what effect that will have, for example, I think there we really need to go beyond the measurements and start to see how can we integrate some of these remote sensing observations, Internet of Things observations into forest models that can tell us how the trees are going to respond to that. And those models exist in many cases, I think. There's a long history of forest models, of course, and many of them are physiologically based in some form. So I have the capability to take these data streams, but there's a sometimes disconnect between the types of parameters those models use and those that lend themselves to, for example, being derived from remote sensing. So, you know, a lot of traditional forest models would be based on the diameter of the trunk, whereas remote sensing measures things like the height and the crown size more readily. So I think there's work to do there. I think one challenge is bringing these things together, the digital data side with the, the modeling community to really build models that work. But there's some great work in that direction already. I think there's lots of technologies we're maybe not using in this project, but that can build forest models, LIDAR and grand mosaic scanning, for example, to reconstruct the, the sort of forest um, structure and so on. And I think if those, uh, you know, they're being brought together increasingly, I think we're not that far off in this context from being able to produce these kind of digital twins that could help us to explore those interactions between different stresses. So I think at the moment we're sort of siloing a bit, you know, we've got ash dieback, we've got drought stress, but actually how are those interacting? What would we expect mm. the impact on tree health to be when we have both drought stress and a new pest and disease hitting at the same time, for example? Um, the challenges, though, I think remain the speed of change. I mean, not least in terms of new pests and diseases arriving, for example, and new stresses to the treescape arising, um, but also in the technology pace of change. So even since we started this project, there's new tree talkers available. You know, we could we could upgrade the system already, um, which is quite a challenge, I think, to keep up with that, if you like. And the other big challenge is the funding streams. We need long term funding covering multiple sites which lets us deploy these kind of technologies to build up the data that's needed to produce a true digital twin of these kind of environments to, to support those projects of course one needs the demonstrators first to to show I realize that yeah. show the value and the uh, well that that's been fantastic i think i think uh that's with with that last comment on digital twins will if we may just bring things to a close now looking at the the time thank you so much for that it's really fascinating to hear about that project and also um it, it's wonderful to sort of hear about this project in the 
uh, in the context of the other demonstrate projects that are running. And many of the challenges that that you're facing are actually ones that are uh, are clearly ones that other other folks have have grappled with as well. Um, so thank you very much to all the the panelists today, and thank you very much for the the audience. Uh, it's been a very interesting discussion, all about the way that digital environment practices and principles are, are put put into place uh, for solving uh, in, environmental challenges. It's, it's been a good a good uh, series that we've we've had in this webinar. Um, the video for this, as with all our other ones, will be available on our YouTube channel, and there's a link in the in the chat coming up on that youtube.com at NERC digital environment you can have a look at look at this video which will be shortly available and the other one so we now look forward to the next series of webinars in the constructing a digital environment where we're going to focus in a bit more on the the science around artificial intelligence and machine learning in in environmental science and we'll start that seventh webinar series on um 31st of March, Friday the 31st of March, three weeks time, and um, we'll receive a, a sort of keynote for that from Professor David Topping from the University of Manchester, who'll be speaking about uh, AI and environmental sciences, from research developments to underlying infrastructure and policy implementation, and I'm sure, uh, like me, you're, you'll be looking forward to hearing uh, Professor Topping speaking about that. So once more, thank you so much to the panelists, to the audience. And I wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.